I know the tech they're using. It can't track us. Not, not specifically. That's a fact. They can see that someone is watching, but they can't see who is watching. So... How do they fucking know it's fucking me? I'm sorry. I'm... I'm sorry. I'm good. I am. Uh... <clears throat> this Sean guy. He's... Getting to me. I knew it before. And I'm damn certain of it now. He... Hasn't hurt anyone yet. So... No one wants to do anything about it. But I'm telling you... I'm telling you... <clears throat> something bad is going to happen. This is my psyche bell, and I'm not supposed to push cases, but I'm saying it again. This kid has bad friends, and they're planning something. They're planning something really ghastly. Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music monsters and mayhem killers cannibals and cults fearful fiction and furious fact tall tales and terrifying truths this is a scary home companion long before she became mona skellington she was mindy deaner a girl from the suburbs with software company coders for parents. Mona was raised surrounded with technology. And as kids often do, she soaked it all up with her impressionable brain. By age 14, Mona was playing around with hacking into websites and social media pages. It just gave her a little thrill. Made her feel more alive. When she was 18, Mona was living on her own, paying the bills with her computer skills and building a rep under her new name. Mindy Diener was gone, appearing only on the inside of birthday cards from her parents. Mona Skellington was who she was now. Around that time, she connected with a hacker group called Crew Street. They were on another level for most of the people that she knew. Although Mona didn't care for their sense of humor, she knew there was a lot she could learn from them. And for a couple of years, that was true. Despite the juvenile nature of the Crew Street antics, the tech and coding behind them was light years beyond where Mona had been previously. So she learned as much as she could, for as long as she could, before she finally outstripped her mentors. At which point she walked away. And this was in 2010. Mona had simply gone as far as she could go with Ginger and the Crew Street gang. It wasn't the illegal nature of their work that bothered her. That part she actually liked. It was the growing sense of spite behind it. Mona didn't have spite in her. Why the fuck would she? She was making great money, all of it untaxable and untraceable. She had freedom. She got to do what she loved to do. She was living the dream. Mona didn't have reason nor inclination to fuck around with people just for the sake of fucking around with them. She left that to the Crew Street boys while she branched out into exciting new areas of cybercrime and had a damn good time while doing so. Here's the perfect place to give you a snapshot of Mona Skellington. She might have looked like the girl next door if it weren't for all the tattoos. 
She might have been a dead ringer for Homecoming Queen, except for Mona didn't like to wear makeup, and her hair existed almost exclusively in a sloppy pile on the back of her head. She presented as a woman entirely unfettered by the constrictions of the male gaze. She had a boyfriend, more often than not, and a robust love of sex, as was befitting a woman her age. But she never concerned herself with how the world viewed her. Mona had always been so alive in her own mind, so taken with the far-off realms of coding, that she never stopped and learned to give a shit if anyone thought she was pretty. Mona loved music and movies. Soul music. Etta and Aretha and Otis and Marvin. And heist movies. Rafifi and The Sting and Dog Day and Oceans. Mona enjoyed the giddy feeling she got from smoking pot, but otherwise avoided drinking and drugs. She didn't have a problem with any of that shit. She just preferred to always stay sharp. Mona spent four years working in the shadows of the internet as a cyber criminal, growing her reputation and her asking price. This was the period of her life where she made the acquaintance of an old-school thief named Quentin Arbogast. Mona had been in between boyfriends at the time and enjoyed a bit of a schoolgirl crush on the older man during the extent of their working relationship. Quentin felt like he stepped right out of one of the heist movies that she loved so much. He was ridiculously smart, perfectly professional, and ever the gentleman. Also, he paid top fucking dollar. Aside from Quentin, though, Mona was rapidly tiring of this line of work. She had reached a point where she didn't have to work for several years, at least, and would never have to worry about money. Much like with Crew Street, Mona felt that she was outgrowing her surroundings. Once she got past the initial challenges, it all felt kind of empty. She needed something more. Something substantial. When Quentin Arbogast retired, Mona took it as a sign that she should as well. This was in the early days of 2015. For her 25th birthday, Mona took a cruise. Then she flew to Europe. Then she went hiking in Washington State. She did a lot of soul-searching and thought about using her skills, and her newfound free time to maybe help a charity or back an organization that could make a difference. She could fight sex tourism or trafficking, do something that had teeth. As if in answer to a silent prayer, Mona received a private message from someone named Sadie Jane. Sadie had a job offer for her. The very kind of thing she had been searching for. Sadie wanted to bring her on with a very generous salary to track illegal organizations and perpetrators. It was data collection, but with a very specific purpose. There was a war being fought online. Sadie said that the good guys needed some black hats to make it a fair fight. And then Sadie dropped the A-bomb. A as in Ambrose. Ambrose as in Lila Ambrose. 
The ultra-wealthy humanitarian and fashionista was bankrolling this whole black hat operation. Not that it could ever be proven, officially, of course, but behind the scenes, the old woman was still trying to make the world a better place by any means necessary. And this hit twice as hard for Mona, because Lila Ambrose was not only a legend, she was a personal hero. Here was a woman who had always made charity and humanitarian efforts a part of her business model. Lila had always been committed to using her wealth and her influence to help others. How could Mona resist? Three weeks later, she was moving into a new home on the coast of Florida, ready to start a new chapter in her life. Okay. I, I hate doing these things, but I get why they matter to you, so I'm going to try and take it seriously. Um, it may take me a few tries. This isn't a video diary, but that's totally what it reminds me of. But yes, yes, it's either this or a weekly meeting with a counselor. So I will approach these videos as just another part of my job. What's my state of mind? <laughs> That's the prompt. Um, I'm excited, fucking psyched. Um, this feels like an opportunity to make a difference. As corny as that sounds, it's true. You, you get to a point in your life and you have to stop fucking around. You need to sink your teeth into something. Something that matters. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I'm positive. I'm happy. I'm ready to do some real work. So, that's it? Okay, bye. That sounds weird. Do I say bye? That sounds weird. Mona's dream job just kept getting dreamier. Her swank new condo had a full view of the ocean for crying out loud. She had free transportation to and from the building that she worked out of. And, and, best of all, this job tested for every drug except marijuana, which was, for some reason, encouraged. Lila Ambrose owned several different cannabis dispensaries throughout Florida. All of her employees had carte blanche to use the company account and never pay a dime, no matter how much they smoked. On the other hand, the work was a lot more boring than anticipated. This organization was watching people who followed an arcane mythology based around the ghastly ones. Mona had heard about the hand collector and faceless before. They were urban legends. The fact that these urban legends had so many devout followers came as a bit of a shock, but just served as more motivation for her to keep fighting the good fight. Despite the languor of the day-to-day, -day, Mona knew that she was doing something important for the first time. It might have been data mining, but it was data mining on horrific pieces of shit who needed to be watched. Still, it was data mining. It was spreadsheet entry. It was database upkeep. It was deadly fucking Dullsville is what it was, no matter how righteous the cause might be. She also had to submit weekly psych evals in the form of video diaries. This was so that her mental health could be tracked on an ongoing basis. Mona didn't like doing it, but she knew it was a key part of the job, so she tried her best to adapt. Although 
she had no desire to fuck up her day job, when Quentin Arbogast came back into her life and asked for help on one final score, Mona had no choice but to say yes. How could she resist? Quentin's last heist involved an old fortress on Grand Bahama Island. It was the site of a big religious massacre some years before. Mona legitimately had no idea that her boss had any connection to this fortress. If she did, she wouldn't have touched it. As it stood, she was right in the middle of the extraction part of the heist. She was helping Quentin and his team get out of the fortress when her personal line rang. It was Sadie Jane. This was bad. Sadie worked in recruitment and administration. Mona hadn't spoken with Sadie since their initial interview. But she was calling. <whistles> spoke volume. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Sadie snapped at her. Mona was working from home. She offered to come into the office to discuss the matter and try and settle it. Sadie said there was no need for that. She was almost to Mona's house. By the time she entered the front door, Sadie was completely calm. Although she wore a gun on her side as an unspoken threat. One made all the more clear when she unbuttoned her jacket and let it hang open. Sadie asked for all the details, every last fucking one of them. And Mona didn't hold back. When it was all said and done, Sadie seemed satisfied. No more freelancing, she warned. I'm so sorry, Mona apologized for the tenth time. I didn't know it was connected. Listen, Mona. It's the most important thing you can take away from this incident. Listen. Everything is connected. Mona had expected to get a reprimand of some kind. Instead, the next day, she got a promotion. Based on her psyche evals and her work rate, it seemed pretty obvious that Mona was bored and that she felt underutilized. So she was given something a lot more hands-on, for better or worse. Better in the way that it was more active and less passive in the war against evil. Worse in that it immediately began to grind away at her soul. I, I understand why we stay quiet, but it fucking sucks. If we take down one guy talking dangerous shit, then 20 other dangerous assholes he was talking to all scatter and we lose them. We let them talk so we can get them all. But the shit they fucking say, man, fuck. <laughs> Feelings. <clears throat> right. Yes. Um, I got the email. I need to talk less about cases and more about my state of mind. My feelings. I guess I feel surprised. I thought I had a handle on how shitty this world is, but I wasn't even close. So I'm like, fuck, because of them and because of me. How did I not know the world was like this? I'm disappointed I'm not handling it better. I thought I could handle anything. Now, I don't know. Mona was on the front lines now. Metaphorically speaking, of course. She was in the same nameless office building where she had been working all along. Only on a different floor. And with a more serious set of colleagues. Their enemy needed to be watched, studied, and identified. Before, Mona had been tracking specific people and businesses through their data, 
Now she was identifying those who needed to be watched or taken down. There were longer hours, more frequent psych evals, and far more challenging work. She was assigned to track a series of message boards. She had to verify all content, meaning she had to read the posts, follow the links, verify the accounts, listen to the audio, and watch the video. A total sit rep for each message board. It was basically more data mining, but much more personally affecting far more disturbing. On her first day in the new chair, Mona had to watch from beginning to end a series of videos of stray animals being tortured, beaten, and burned alive. Two different sick, twisted fucks in two different countries sharing videos of their four-legged victims and laughing at the screams from off-camera. Mona had the skills to spike the whole message board. She could easily report both of these assholes to the respective authorities and do it anonymously. She wasn't allowed to do that. That wasn't the job. Mona had to be sure that the info was passed up the chain of command. That's why she was doing this, to find who needed to be taken down. If any of their team responded out of emotion, it could reveal their work. They needed to be ever cautious and never leave a footprint. If the freaks knew that they were being watched, it would spook the whole herd. So, no matter how horrible it may be, Mona was powerless to act directly against it. What she could do was to give her recommendations for action. Shutting the site down was one option, as was turning it over to the DRO or the FBI or God only knows. That first day was a day's worth of work that she couldn't help but to take home with her. The second day wasn't any better, nor was the third. She quickly learned that there was no such thing as getting better at the job. If it got better, it just meant that you weren't looking in the right places or you were starting to die inside. Not every single day entailed graphic videos of animals being killed. That was just part of it. Sometimes it was pornographic fanfic involving ghastly ghouls and buxom corpses. Or maybe it would be lovingly detailed sketches of vivisected sex organs. The images... The videos were actually nothing in comparison to the rage and the hate behind them. These deranged people might be jumping on a ghastly cult bandwagon, but in every case, it was their own dark urges, predominantly violent sexual urges, that had brought them to this point. It was prevalent. It was poisonous. It was malevolent. And it got under her skin in ways that she never imagined. If Mona had a boyfriend at that time, she would have dumped him after that first week in the chair. Not long after, she started drinking. Drinking with a capital D drinking. Before, she had never wanted to dole her wits with booze. But now, after a shift, any shift, 
Doling her wits was all that she wanted to do. She alternated between cigarettes and joints while gradually working her way up the ladder from beer to wine to brown liquor. Well, a field trip today. That was different. All the shit I have to look at every day. It's it's traumatizing and everything, but um, it's still on the screen. We went to Miami for, well, I shouldn't discuss the case, but I saw some shit up close and personal. This woman blew herself up. A little boy got his fucking head cut off. I saw someone who had the skin on her head turned around so the face was on the back of her skull. Like, how is that shit even fucking possible? <sighs> Jesus. I, I need to do it, though. If not me, who? Dead women? Dead children? Nine times out of fucking ten, a man is holding the knife and I'm supposed to just cut and run? Fucking quit? I mean, I'd like to do that. <laughs> I really would. I don't think I can. My state of mind. Ah, yes. Um, it's good. It's... I'm fine. I'm fine. In for a penny, in for a pound, right? From time to time, there were victories. She helped people. She saved people. And that is what kept Mona going. Victories like Jessica, meanwhile. Mona had discovered Jessica on one of the less dangerous, ghastly forums. She knew this kid was in over her head, that she was in a lot of danger, so she made it a priority to her bosses. None other than Sadie Jane took a personal interest in the girl. This was the first time that Mona had learned there was a whole other arm to the operation. There was a field team, consisting of Sadie Jane and a couple of heavily armed goons. They saved Jessica, meanwhile, in 2017, which was about a year previous to this. The fact that she had helped save a kid's life was still one of Mona's proudest achievements, but after a year, it felt very distant and increasingly hidden behind crashing waves of perversity and cruelty. Every day, Mona saw snuff videos, rape videos, executions, necrophilia, grave robbing. Jesus Christ, her old running buddies from Crew Street took a dark path and started playing with corpses. After that, they just went off the grid for a while. Slowly and steadily, a world of shit piled up on Mona's shoulders. She felt ground down to nothing. Mona was at home, not looking at her magnificent view of the ocean, just sitting in the dark, drinking and well on her way to drunk. There came a soft rap-a-tap tapping on the front door. Mona just waited for the person to go away. There was another knock, and then she heard, Miss Mona? My name is Jessica. I know this is weird, but I heard about you, and I... Mona threw the door open and threw her arms around the teenager standing on her doorstep. Immediately, she saw another person, a massive woman, who quickly separated the two and pulled Mona off of Jessica. It's okay, Epiphany, Jessica clucked, 
It's okay. Mona's just happy. She don't look happy to me, the big woman responded. Epiphany wore a knee brace, a jean jacket, and a scowl. Mona turned on the lights and would have asked her visitors to sit, but everything was somehow draped in dirty laundry, despite the fact that Mona wore the same black t-shirt 90% of the time. So they all stood. I wanted to say thank you, Jessica continued. Without you, I wouldn't be here. Some old lady would be wearing my skin. It makes me so happy to meet you, Jessica, Mona said. Thank you, but that's not... Only reason I came here, Mona, see, people are worried about you, okay? Your work is excellent. No one is saying that your work isn't excellent. But I've seen your videos. So I'm worried too, okay? I don't understand, Mona said. I sort of work for Miss Ambrose now. She thinks I'm a good judge of character. Epiphany sighed. Oh, here we go with this again. It's how I got to meet Epiphany. And now I got to meet you too. I get to meet a lot of people. But not too many like you, that's for sure. Listen, Mona. I can tell you're a good person. But I can also tell... You're being hurt by this job. So maybe, maybe think about not doing it anymore. If that sentiment had come from any other person on earth, Mona would have considered it. She probably would have jumped at it. She thought about little else these days but quitting. This was Jessica fucking. Meanwhile, this was the one piece of tangible good Mona had done for the world. She could never quit. Not to Jessica. <sighs> You're right. Uh, maybe I need a vacation. Jessica, I can't quit. What we do here, it's too important. Jessica smiled when she heard that. Really? Really? Oh, it's so good to hear, because we need you, Mona. You're an ace. You're the best. Everybody says so. Oh, by the way, next week, I have to come by the offices. Miss Ambrose wants me to talk to everybody. But I'm going to have to play it cool. I can't let on that you and me are friends, but... I kind of feel like we're friends. After that, work felt a little better for Mona. For a while. And then she discovered Sean McNamara. So I saw a dog get set on fire today. Really took me back and made me think of my first day on the job here. That's some kind of fucked up job we have, isn't it? But at least we're making a difference. Right? It doesn't feel like it very often, honestly. What's my state of mind? Feeling like we're just amassing data to have fucking data. I know we shut down a lot of sites. I... We send some people to jail. Worse even, if the rumors about Sadie are true. But that's not enough. I don't know that anything could ever be enough. Not enough jails for them all. So I'm feeling kind of frustrated because I know we could do more. I know we can do more. But I also don't know what that is. I'm a keyboard jockey. I'm not an agent, I'm not a killer. There's only so much I can do. 
The thing about Sean McNamara that was so interesting was his commitment, his quiet but fervent devotion. Sean wasn't ranting and raving. He was speaking with the calm, clear purpose of a missionary. He also didn't seem to be as hung up on sex and violence as so many of the others that Mona had to watch, which should have made Sean McNamara feel less dangerous. But, but, there was something she couldn't quite put her finger on with him. Something that felt different than what it said in his file. Initially, she had searched out Sean McNamara for a reason. Sean had been put on their radar after signing up for a human hunt with a group called the Gunny Men. Now, why Miss Ambrose didn't shut down the Gunny Men entirely was a mystery to Mona. Instead of doing that, they traced and tracked anyone who used their services. Mona kept watching all of Sean's videos, even after she needed to, because her bosses didn't see the danger. Only she did. Sean was starting to ramp up. And then he mentioned Mona by name and gave her a message from Ginger. Ginger, of all people, from back in the day with Crew Street, Ginger, who had gone on to form the Dismemberists, which had been four years ago at this point, and since then there had only been rumor and innuendo about the Dismemberists. Ginger must have been coaching Sean. But why him? And why her? And why now? Not to mention... How? There was no way they could know she was watching him. There was no goddamn motherfucking way they could know that. But, due to Mona's last few months' worth of psyche vowels and dearth of actionable content on Sean McNamara, the bosses dismissed Mona's concerns as self-aggrandizing. Now, this wasn't her bosses in terms of Sadie Jane or Lila Ambrose. Those people didn't handle the operations. They were upper management. Mona's direct supervisor was Miss Tajiri, and then Victoria Bondurant was her boss. Sadie was only consulted on emergencies, and Lila Ambrose wasn't consulted at all. She only got involved when she decided to get involved. There was a very rigid chain of command in this job. And this chain of command had shut Mona down. They did not want to hear about Sean fucking McNamara anymore. So Mona decided that she was tired of being told to sit idle and to wait. The way that she saw it, there was only one play she had to make. She didn't know if it was going to work, but she thought it was worth a shot. After all, it was better than doing nothing. Jessica Meanwhile's email is a part of their list serve, so Mona messaged her. She asked Jessica to come by her office whenever she could which turned out to be the following morning, bright and early. Jessica even brought Bear Claw. Epiphany carried coffee for all. Mona closed the door to her office, and the three sat around her desk and talked while they had breakfast. Mona explained her situation. Jessica wanted to see one of the videos, and Mona balked. I don't know... I shouldn't show you. I could get fired for just talking about it. Jessica waved her hand dismissively. Bah. No such thing. Trust me. 
Miss Ambrose likes you. She does? She said that? No, well, I like you, and Miss Ambrose trusts me on stuff like this. So show me the video. Mona played them the video where Sean called to her by name. Hold up, Epiphany growled. Hold up. Mona paused it. Sean was caught in still frame. I know that asshole, Epiphany said. He was there that night. That night you and me met, Jess. Jessica squinted at the screen. Oh, 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 holy crackers, that's the clown man. Yep, that's the one you caught doing. Mm -hmm. That's him. Mona, we know who this is, and yes, he's gross, but that was with the gunny men. That's a whole different thing than the ghastly ones. No, Mona corrected her. He was with the gunny men. He switched over. He's doing this now. Jessica looked at Epiphany, who flared her nostrils and folded her arms across her chest. Okay, we're in. Let's go. Mona chuckled. What do you mean, let's go? Didn't you hear me say that Miss Ambrose trusts me? I get to pick my projects, Mona. We can have a plane ready in two, maybe three hours. It'll take us wherever we want to go. So where is this big, bad thing that's going to happen? Mona looked back and forth between her two visitors. And they stared at her, waiting for guidance. Well, I have an educated guess. It's here, it's finally here, the Fantasticon, bigger, better, bolder than ever before. Over 200 vendors, original artwork, rare comics and collectibles, games, movies, anime, and manga you won't find anywhere else. Previews of this summer's biggest blockbusters, live appearances and autograph signings from LeVar Burton, Clive Barker, Cheryl Lee, Doug Jones, Gareth Evans, Bernie Wrightson, Joe Lansdale, Brian Azzarello, Garth Ennis, and more, more, more! Join Bill Mosley, Tony Todd, Danny Trejo, and Diamond Dallas Page for a Devil's Reject meet and greet! See the world champion Olympic archers don their very own cosplays to prove once and for all who is the best Hawkeye, Green Arrow, Katniss Everdeen, Princess Merida, or Rambo. Meet seven-eighths of the cast of Buffy the Vampire Slayer at the reunion panel. The notorious larp executioner has even threatened to make an appearance, so the police say stay away, and we say just you try and stay away. The Fantasticon isn't just the best con of the year, it's the best con ever, 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 ever. Thank you for listening to another episode of A Scary Home Companion. Find the show on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook and once in a while, Twitter. Email us directly at a scary home companion at gmail.com. Best of all, support the show on Patreon. Not only do you help keep horror alive, you will find exclusive episodes never to be released anywhere else. 
including the newest one, a deep-dive character study about Jack and Sadie. You won't find a sexy home companion anywhere else but Patreon. If you'd like a greater context on Mona's story, make sure to listen to the Lerpsecutioner's song and the Dismemberists. Although her tale does touch on a dozen or so other episodes, most notably the ghastly heist and Apex Predators. Guest voices this time, provided by the talented Courtney Kelly and the lovely Dan Joplin. The episode was edited and produced by Jeff Davidson. It featured the music Heartbeat Ghost by Y.E.T. The Air Black by River of No. And Chelsea Oxendine with the theme music.